Good morning to all of you on the West Coast and good afternoon to all of you on the East Coast. Hello to all of you in between. Uh, my name is Dan Belcarin. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to be your employment lawyer for the next uh, for the next 30 minutes. Uh, general housekeeping, as you can see on the uh, the Chiron there below, I am an associate lawyer for the law firm of San Fierro to Markin. San Fierro to Markin is Canada's leading uh, employee side employment law firm. Uh, more general housekeeping. If you need to get a hold of us or get a hold of me, you can do so at employmentlawyer.ca. You can reach us at help at employmentlawyer.ca, uh, or you can call us at 1-855-821-5900. Okay, so for the last seven or eight months um, that we've been doing this here, uh, almost all of your questions have been about uh, vaccine mandates, vaccine terminations. That started to change uh, in our discussion, our, our, our live chat discussion last week. Uh, there certainly were some vaccine questions, but they started to peter out. Uh, and and so I, I imagine that's going to continue to be the trend because everyone who has lost their job due to uh, not complying with a mandatory vaccine policy uh, or, or is going to has already done so. And then there, there seems to be uh, a general sea change across Canada and in the individual provinces about, you know, about the way that that. I'll say vaccine restrictions are perceived and the virus itself is, is perceived. And so there, it doesn't seem to be quite the hot button issue that it was before. Uh, just a little reminder, as I say, uh, before every, uh, every show here, uh, there's a difference between a mandate from the government and a policy from uh, a, a policy from uh, your employer. If your employer institutes, mm -hmm. if your employer institutes a, uh, a vaccine policy and says you must be vaccinated uh, in order to uh, to continue to work here and you elect not to be vaccinated short of a government mandate you are going to or you should have uh, an entitlement to severance that amount of severance can be very lucrative depending on your legal position uh, you know if you're a very long service employee it could be upwards of, of 24 months so it's imperative before um, it's imperative before you make any consequential decisions or take any actions that you speak to a lawyer you can always reach us help employment lawyer.ca 855 821 okay um i'm gonna we've got questions rolling in here uh so i'm gonna ask, uh, address the first one uh this one's from youtube uh, hold on this one's from youtube i uh I reported by email to my boss that I was being bullied by a coworker in management for years. After I reported it, I was targeted by my harasser. Then my boss fired me, blaming for, blaming me for the same thing. Uh, I have five coworkers, five witness statements from coworkers about this person. Uh, she was female, and she used to tell coworkers untrue statements about me and would and name call me, etc. Uh, I'd also just returned from hernia surgery. Okay, so you've lost your job it, it sounds like uh did i did i read that incorrectly yes you got you you, were, you lost your job uh you just returned from hernia surgery it, it, so you i don't know if they terminated you for for what they claim is just cause and paid you zero severance uh just to back up here a second just to load in some concepts your only legal right your your employer can terminate your employment at any time your only legal right in the event of your termination is severance it's the amount of severance, you know, I'll just say that. It, it, the only legal right, your only legal right in the event of your termination is, is severance. Now, it's a bad outcome for society if you're thrown out in the street with no money and no job. So the laws evolve this idea of severance in order to tide you over until you get your, your next job, sort of like a safety net or a safety cushion um, to, to tide you over until you get your next job that pays you the same. So the law wants you to get severance. However, um, there's a there's something called just cause, which is just simply a legally justifiable reason for the employer uh, to not have to pay you severance. And so uh, there are different ways you can get there. One is a single act that's so egregious that your their employer is justified no longer continuing the employment relationship. Another is um, an ongoing uh, failure to meet performance expectations that you've been provided clear warning of and an opportunity to correct. So that's your classic three written warnings and you're out. The first one would be your classic, you know, you punch your boss in the face or you come into work uh, intoxicated or, or um, you know, you steal, theft, fraud, that, that kind of thing. Uh, if you were committing harassment and it was found that you were committing 
you know, sexual harassment or, or some form of harassment, that would be sufficient to ground just cause, but, and, and so the, your employer could pay you zero, but the bar is, is very high for just cause. So in your case, I don't have your name, but you know, if they didn't terminate you for just cause, you've got a severance claim, depends on what your legal position is, depends what your employment contract says, you should hundred percent talk to a lawyer as soon as possible. Uh, you can always reach us again at helpemploymentlawyer.ca and 1-855-821-5900. Um, but you, you haven't said whether or not they paid you any severance or not. But, it, you know, this this kind of thing with, with bosses is, 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 you know, I mean, you expect people to behave on, in an honest fashion and people can be honestly mistaken about, you know, conflicts between parties and what they mean. Um, but, you know disagreements with bosses does you know they do happen all the time and and people upstream from that tend to row in line with what the chain of command is and so you know if, if your job is very important to you you kind of want to head that off or change that dynamic before it gets to this point uh, you know as i said your only legal right in the event of your termination is severance and and for many of you that's that's what you want and for some of you uh, you know, that's a poor substitute for losing your job. So you've, you, you, you want to try to get ahead of these things before they happen, speak to a lawyer ahead of time, because if, if you speak to us after the fact, we're, we're just doing uh, damage control at that point, or we're trying to get you compensation. And it depends again, what your objective is. So, so, um, you know, keeping your job versus getting money on your way out the door. So, so think about all that stuff first and talk to an, a, an employment lawyer at the appropriate uh, time period. Okay. Thanks for that question. It was a good one. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's go to the next. They're, they're rolling in. Uh, JC, JC has uh, emailed us many times uh, and asked many questions. Thanks for contacting us again, JC. Uh, what happens if there's a government mandate in place for an industry, but the employer does not inform you of that when hiring? Would you be owed severance? No, it, 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 it doesn't matter if the employer informs you of it or not. The mandate exists, which means you cannot work if you're not vaccinated in that given uh, sector industry, and therefore you have no right to anything. The government mm -hmm. extinguished that. If, if you don't think that's fair, uh, contact your, I don't know if you're, this is a federal or provincial mandate, but if it's a provincial one, contact your MP. If it's a federal one, con, con, sorry, it's a provincial one, contact your MLA. If it's a federal one, contact your MP uh, and express your displeasure. Um, people, I mean, this isn't a, a legal comment, but people often sort of poo poo the, the you know, our democratic processes, but if, if you don't like something, call your representative. Enough calls get through, laws change. So, so, but yes, the if you have if there's a mandate in place, you don't have a right to anything, JC. Uh, Belinda, Belinda has also contacted us before. Good to see you again, Belinda. Uh, what kind of changes to my position is my employer allowed to make? I, I have a, I have, I've had a steady increase in my duties over the last year, and it doesn't feel right. This is a really interesting question. So. This is again goes back to what I was saying to the earlier person. You have to decide what it is you want. Figure out what your your objective is, and then and then every all your strategy underneath it flows from what the objective is. So, uh, if you're employed, okay. So you're working for your employer under a contract of employment, effectively. Even if you don't have one written down, you're you're working under a contract of employment that has certain terms. And so the core of it is you're doing. Uh, you're getting paid a certain amount of money to work a certain amount of hours to do a certain amount of duties. Okay. And so if your employer unilaterally imposes on you radically different duties than you've been working under before, it is possible that that, and, and you reject the, that, the, that radical change, it is possible that that imposition is a constructive dismissal, constructive termination, of your employment because your employer is effectively indicating it doesn't, it's, it's no longer bound by, or it no longer tends to be bound by the, the, the terms of the contract of employment that you were working under. However, in, in almost every employment situation, especially when money gets tight, giving you more tasks is an indication that, you know, the, the employer values your either needs more help or, or values your, your, um, contribution such that's trusting you for more work and you know a gradual increase of of your employment duties is not going to get you to just cause I, I think you'd have to have some sort of major radical sea change which you were not compensated for you know where you 
you know, you, you were the janitor and now you're the manager of 50 people and your pay hasn't changed. You know, it, 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 I, I, I think in almost every situation, if they're giving you more work, that's a situation where they, there's no, there's no road to your very likely no road to you terminate getting terminated. And therefore there's no road to you getting severance. Um, if you don't want all those duties or you want to, you want to keep those duties, but get a corresponding pay raise reflective of and commensurate with those duties, that's a discussion you have with your employer. Uh, and it's entirely based on the goodwill of your employer and you want it to be amicable. And so, um, you, don't, you never, when you're having these negotiations, you know, employers, in my experience, don't like to be pushed for more money. But they, you know, some will do it, some will situation and your value to the company. And so you, you have to make that assessment and, and then determine if you can negotiate with your employer on that basis for more money. Uh, and that, of course, depends on what your leverage is. But that's not a legal, that's not a legal matter. Your only legal matter there would be is if it's if it's a constructive termination, res therefore resulting in your ability to get severance. But but I just don't see. Well, I shouldn't say I don't see it. It would just it would have to be a, a sea change in your duties and not a a gradual increase in in your duties. Um, but but you know then again at some point the increase is going to be so substantial that if your pay doesn't commensurately rise. Uh, you know, I could see that being a constructive dismissal, you know, by sort of like a, you know, in, in cumulative effect, I guess we'll say. But I, I just I I think that's tough. I think that in most most situations, oh, you're doing a good job. Here's more work, you know, and and that's just part of employment. OK, Christian, can I sue my employer and WSIB um, for wrongful termination from a work related accident and discrimination? So. Not familiar with the WSIB. I think that's like BC's WorkSafe. It's an occupational health and safety body, um, tribunal, um, government entity. Uh, so if you suffered a work-related accident and now you can't work, your employer is prohibited from terminating you unless effectively, you know, there's no chance of you coming back and it's been two to three years that you've been un unable to work and, and there's no medical hope of you coming back. Your employer's got to give you your job back, or or if it doesn't have your job, some sort of reasonable equivalent. And so, uh, if if you've lost your job, you very much have, very likely have a uh, um, you very likely have a wrongful dismissal claim, which is going to be it's going to flow from what your legal position is. So what does your employment contract say, and then what is your age, length of service, and what your position was. Uh, but if you are currently getting uh, works whatever WSIB, uh, WSIB payments for your injury, that money is going to be, that, that's effectively income replacement wages. So whatever your severance claim is, which is going to flow from your date of termination forward, those, that, those payments from the, from the Occupational Health and Safety Board are going to be deducted dollar for dollar. So your, your claim might be relatively small, depending upon the length of your, your injury payments. Um, the WSIB is also going to look very negatively upon the fact that that they terminated you um, in violation of, of most likely in violation of its of its uh, statute, and you may have some sort of remedy through there. But I'm I'm not familiar with it. But but yes, you you should talk to a lawyer to find out uh, if if you have a severance claim based on you know what your legal position is, you know specifically what your contract says. And then also, you know, how long you're going to be getting these, if, if, if you are getting them, this, these um, wage replacement injury payments from the WSIB, because that, that might nullify your severance claim or reduce it to the point where you can't get a lawyer involved. But, but Kristen, you should talk to a lawyer. So uh, get a hold of us if you'd like at uh, employmentlawyer.ca, help at employmentlawyer.ca and one 821 5900 Okay. Um, I'm not going to say this person's name. I don't want to potentially give away their 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 name. Um, Non-union members are entitled to severance if there's no government mandate for vaccines. How about for union members heading to arbitration? So I don't know enough about the, that side of 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 the ball in terms of um, unionized employees. 
However, a government mandate is a government mandate, so I, I can't see how your membership uh, affiliation would affect it at all. If there's a government mandate saying that you're um, you're not entitled to work in the sector if you are not vaccinated, I I don't really see that the employer has like the employer can't have you work, right? So uh, if it's heading towards arbitration, then then obviously something else is going on that I'm not I can't see just by based on what you're saying. Um, but I would certainly talk to your union representative about this if it is heading to arbitration and, and see what they have to say. But I, I can't, unfortunately, add uh, anything of any utility to the discussion about that um, other than a mandate is a mandate. And if the government says you can't work, you can't work. It's the law. The government is the law of the land. You know, they have absolute power as fettered within the, the structures of our constitutional order. But if the law, the government duly and properly passes the law, everyone has to obey that law and if they don't you know the ultimate answer is is you know enforcement by the police so and 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 then ultimately our, our legal system so no i mean if 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 your employment is subject to unless i'm again missing something entirely that i'm not aware of is it subject to a government mandate i don't i don't see how you have a a claim to to work at that point uh jc's back uh excuse me one sec jc Do transportation related mandates extend to logistic warehouses or is that only passengers on trains? Okay. Uh, I mean, this is, this sounds like federally, re federally regulated entities. So transportation, trains, planes, Marine, uh, are covered and some trucking as we found out during the, 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 um, the trucker protests, uh, do transportation related mandates extend to logistics warehouses? Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I would I, I would think that the mandate covers anyone in train who works in the train industry. So I would assume yes. But but that's a level level of granularity that I don't think has been considered yet. Uh, and I wouldn't be able to answer that question right off the cuff, unfortunately. But my gut says, yes, yes, it covers everybody in in um, uh, who works in the train industry. I guess interprovincial uh, train transport. So, um, Mariah, can employer can my employer request my medical information while I'm medical leave? I don't feel comfortable with giving them my medical hit full medical history. Well, I, I don't, Mariah. I don't know what this is for. I, I, I mean, are you are they asking for your vaccine status? They're they're seeing you know even though, excuse me, asking for your. Medical status seems to be a violation of your privacy rights. Uh, generally, you know, what, what are your options in, in terms of fighting that? There seems to be sort of an accepted that that it's been accepted. I would say that that they can ask for that, um, but you know, there's a difference between asking for your vaccination status and your full medical history. So I don't, I don't I, no. So generally, your employer can't ask you for your full medical history. But it, again, it depends on context and what's going to happen, right? Like if if you say if they say I want my, you know I want your full medical history, they, they want your full medical history, and you say no, are they going to fire you? Okay, well that's is that a real concern? And you have to think about it. Okay, well if they are going to fire you, what are your rights flowing from that? How devastating is it for you to lose your job? Um, you know, if you have remedies under, uh, you know, you have severance remedies and maybe potential remedies under the privacy legislation, is that is that going to be for you, commensurate satisfaction with losing your job, I, you know, that's those are questions you have to ask. But Mariah, I can't really answer that question without uh, more information because I don't know what you mean by full medical information, and I don't know why they're asking it. So, uh, Tracy asks, we went through arbitration and had our termination changed to laid off. Okay, started back at work on May eighth with, with full seniority. I've been trying to get employment insurance from October 1 till start date, and it's been six weeks and still no EI. My record of employment was changed and substituted to EI on February 19th. Any suggestions to getting money? Employer would not give severance. Well, I mean, so you've, the employer wouldn't give you severance. You can, you've decided to go back to work. So having your job, back is something that you decided was important to you. And you could have in negotiation made that conditional upon 
your employer making you whole during the period of time you were away. It sounds like you were laid off on some sort of COVID layoff, but maybe not. Um, and so you could have made your return conditional upon them providing you that money. Um, if, but you chose not to, so that's done. And, and, and so your only real option at that point is, you know, do you, can you get EI during that period? Now, the government, the federal government, Service Canada is the, the government entity that runs EI. Okay. And Service Canada is a federal entity and EI is a federal program. Uh, the federal government quite a few months now ago now said they changed their policy such that if the reason why you lost or the reason why you were placed on, you were no longer working, we'll say, uh, is because you refused to get vaccinated, uh, then your right to EI is extinguished. Okay. And, and the underlying legislation didn't change. So you, you, you might be able to appeal that and, and your chances of appealing that are, are much higher, um, or, or, successfully appealing that I think are good given that the underlying legislation hasn't changed, but all of the government workers and at the front line are just denying right out of the gate, any right to EI. If the reason why you didn't get it was because you weren't vaccinated. And so you need to call Tracy, you need to call service Canada and you need to ask them, where's my EI. I want it backdated to, you know, the date of my layoff. If, if this is a va for vaccine reasons, though, you, know, you were laid off because you refused to, to get a vaccine or you were put on temporary leave because you refused to get a vaccine, um, then they're not going to give you that money. But if it wasn't that, like if they just put you, your employer just put you on COVID layoff a while back, had nothing to do with being vaccinated. They ask you, you know, then tell them that. And if they ask you, it, it, you know, are you vaccinated? Just say it has nothing to do with that. And, and you're not answering that question. You weren't, it, your layoff had nothing to do with your vaccination vaccination status. And then just put pressure on them to pay. But that it's between you and the remedy that I see is between you and Service Canada because you've already um, you've already reached an agreement between you and your employer. So, I mean, theoretically, you could actually, Tracy, you could try to bring a constructive dismissal claim against your employer for the period of time you're away. But then you know you and I don't know how long you're away for and how much money that that would be worth and and what your your employment contract says and therefore what your legal position is, but but you, it could be worthwhile depending on all of those things. So you may want to talk to a lawyer and you can certainly do so at, uh, by reaching us at employmentlawyer.ca, help at employmentlawyer.ca and 1-855-821-5900. Um, but, you know, just remember, if you do bring something like that, you're probably, you're probably going to eventually lose your job sooner rather than later. Cause you know, once you sue your employer, employer probably doesn't want you to work there anymore. So Lisa asks, what if you are unionized and there is no government mandate in your sector? Well, that, I, I don't, I don't know what your question is, Lisa. I, I, if you're unionized and there's no government mandate in your sector, then it's going to be awfully tough for your employer to get rid of you uh, because you're not vaccinated. I mean, I'm, I'm filling in gaps in, in your question because I don't actually know what your question is. Um, but are you, are you referring to if you're not vaccinated and, and, you know, what rights do you have there? Um, I, I think it's it's very hard to, to terminate people if they're unionized, if they're unionized and they don't have, uh, and you're not vaccinated. But again, I don't know enough about that area. And I would encourage you to to speak to your union representative to find more information about how, how the union is treating, from a collective bargaining perspective, how the union is treating um, vaccine vac staff that are not vaccinated. I'll, I'll say that. Uh, okay, Andy asks, how would I calculate severance on a commission contract? Would I include additional benefits? These are great questions. Okay, Andy, so your only legal right in the event of your termination is severance. And as, as you noted, it's the amount of your severance that matters. And the amount of your severance flows from one of, one of two places. It's going to be sort of, and I don't want to get bogged down in complication, but it's either going to be statutory or it's going to be common law. It's, it's more complicated than that, but I'm just going to simplify for, for that reason. And, and so statutory generally is, is unless you're federally regulated, one, one week per, per year of service to a maximum of eight weeks in most jurisdictions. Um, if you're provincially regulated, uh, common law is an assessment. It's an evaluation of your age, your length of service, the nature of your employment, and the availability of similar employment, provided you're entitled to common law severance, which depends on what your employment contract says. Um, and so it's an assessment, and it varies wildly with those those um factors that i just cited 
you know, if someone is 65, they're going to, they're going to need a lot more severance than if somebody is, is 25. Uh, and so, and it all sort of flows from the, the principle that the purpose of severance is to tide you over until you get your next job. It pays you the same. Uh, it's not a windfall. So, so, the, so if you're entitled to common law severance, common law severance is perspective. It flows from the date of termination forward. And so you're entitled to all of your compensation during the severance period that you would have gotten had you continued to work there. Okay. So it, it's basically like you were still working there. Um, and so whatever compensation you got, you would have gotten during the severance period, like let's just say six months, that's what you would have got. You would have got your pay. Uh, if bonuses that were going to happen, you would have got, you would get those commission, et cetera. And so commission is a hard one because you don't know what your commission going forward was going to be, but a general rule of thumb is to use previous commission history to future project what your commission would have been during the notice period. However, if, you know, if there's evidence from the employer or from you that you had a huge sales pipeline and you'd made all these sales, but you, you just needed to, most commissions are, are, are payable upon collection of the money itself, right? So upon the accounts being received. Um, and, and so if there's evidence, you know, you've got your arm with your spreadsheet, the spreadsheet shows that you made a million dollars worth of sales, uh, and that those would be collected over that six month period and that your commissions would have been, you know, whatever percentage of the million dollars worth of sales, then, then that can take the place of historical data. And so it's, it's, it's really just what to answer your question in simple form, Andy, what would you have made in commissions during the period of the period of time that is your severance period, whatever it is, according to that assessment that we talked about, if you're entitled to common law severance, if you're entitled to only statutory severance, like say eight weeks or less, then I don't want to speak for all the provincial jurisdictions, but in BC, if you're provincially regulated, I believe it's the last eight weeks of, of what you received is what you would get unless you know, there was just a historic outlier in those eight weeks where you made way more money than you normally would get. And then in that case, the, the um, employment standards uh, tribunals tend to look at a longer time period in order to average it out. So it's a little fairer to the employer. Um, okay, Andy, I hope that answered your question. Uh, very good question. Um, following up from an earlier question, there's no government mandate. Uh, okay, so this was the earlier question where non-union non members are entitled to severance if there's no government mandate. For vaccines, how about for union members? Well, if there's no government mandate, then then okay. So so there's no government mandate. So you're you're really just talking. I don't even know what you're talking about. It sounds like you're you were terminated for not being vaccinated, but there's no government mandate. So what are your rights? Depends what your collective bargaining agreement says. So you're unionized. Uh, you know, it depends. Uh, and and I can see why it's going to arbitration, and therefore because the company wants to know if it has the ability to terminate people for not being vaccinated. And I imagine the union does not want the company to have that right. So, so certainly understand why it's going arbitration. So continue to talk to your union representative. I don't have anything more useful to say, unfortunately, um, but, but good luck in your arbitration. Um, Andy says, uh, follow up with Andy. What about work equipment provided? Am I responsible for turning my cell phone or any other Work issued equipment, if it has been my possession and sole means of contact for several years, yes. You, you I mean, I would, I mean, I, it depends what's in your employment contract. If your employment contract says those are all your stuff, then, then, then no. But I'm gonna, there's like an infinitesimally small chance that they are. Uh, and so if it's not your property, of course you can't keep it. Now, if, if all of your contacts run through that cell phone, then, you know, you need to, uh, you need to get a new cell phone and, and make sure you port manually port your contacts over. Um, and then, and then, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it depends on what your employer wants. If your employer does not want you to touch, it's actually very important. If, if let's just say those contacts are vital sales pipeline contacts that you obtained through the company and that information is confidential, then, then you can't take that information. Right. But if you're talking about your personal contacts, um, and you need to get that over to your cell phone. I think that's a little bit different, but you have to be very, very careful with that. Uh, and, and the short answer to your question is, are you entitled to keep that equipment? Almost certainly not. Um, you can talk about it with your employer and see if they're willing to do that. I'm going to say almost certainly they won't be willing to do that. And they'll want that, that equipment back. Um, but you have to be very careful. Like if you have a, a severance claim 
it, there are situations that happen where uh, people in your position will will wipe their computers or wipe their phones when they realize that they have to return all that to the the uh, the employer, and and that can go very badly if you have uh, a, a heavily disputed severance matter that goes to court. Uh, judges don't take too kindly to things like that, you know, where, where, oh, return your equipment. Sure. I'm just going to wipe away all of the important proprietary information, you know, proprietary information that's on there that I've developed over time. So the company can't make use of it. So you gotta be very, very careful with that. I would talk to a lawyer if, if that's a concern to you, or you need to, you feel like you need to wipe your, your, your phone or computer. Again, you can reach us at employmentlawyer.ca, help employmentlawyer.ca, 1-855-821-5900. I didn't realize we're almost out of, well, we're pretty much out of time. Let's see how many more questions we have. And can, yeah, we only have a couple of questions. Uh, I'm going to just go a little bit long, see if we can get these out for everybody. Um, uh, Tracy is back. Termination was due to vaccine mandates. Uh, this was union question again and went to arbitration. Right. So, in ter- yeah. So I, I take it, Tracy, that you... Yeah, Tracy, you, you, you didn't get vaccinated, right? I'm, I'm going to assume that's what you're saying from that. I, EI is not going to give you any money if you didn't get vaccinated. And that was the reason why you were you were not working. Uh, and so I don't and you've already elected to go back. Um, you can talk to your union rep. It sounds like you're 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 represented that you're a member of a union and see if there's any way the company will make you whole for the time that you you missed. But it sounds like your job was more important to you and 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 fair enough. And, and so you went back to work and you you effectively gave up sounds like trying to get paid for the time you were away ei is not going to give you that money if it was because you weren't vaccinated i think you're probably out of luck tracy um sorry i wish i had better news for you uh jordan asks how does sick sick pay work for gig workers who may work for multiple employers the same day example could be two or three shifts of three to four hours each on the same day would that use one day of sick pay entitlements or would that use two or three given it's multiple employers? Well, I think it depends on what your employment contract says uh, for each. What the, it depends, right? So does your employment contract contemplate sick pay, right? And and then if it does, that that's between you and your employer, okay? If you're talking about the mandatory, I know in British Columbia, they, the government just passed, which I think is part of the, the Employment Standards Act now, uh, five days of mandatory sick pay. Uh, you know, how does that work when you're talking about hiving it between, you know, if you work to multiple employers in a, in a given day, I think each one is required to give you five days of sick pay. And so, you know, how does that work for a two to three hour shift? Is that just one, like if, you, if you're sick for two hours and that's your entire shift, is that a whole sick day? I don't know, but, but your rights under the act are for each employer that you have. So I would assume each one, for those of you who are in BC, uh, each uh, each employer is subject to the act and therefore you get five paid sick days for each employer. Hope that answers your question. I, I know very little about the, the, new, uh, the new BC um, legislation with respect to, uh, or the section of, of legislation with respect to the mandatory pay other than what I just said. Um, Lisa's back, uh, she's put on pending She's putting leave pending arbitration. Union says if we lose, we're out of luck. Yeah, I, I would talk to your union rep. They're going to know. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think you have much in terms of EI. And, you know, it's really just can you get that money back from the company during that period of time? And, and uh, you know, talk to your union rep about that. Um, And then JC's back, okay, uh, saying, asking, yes, he was a fellow who was talking about uh, transportation, yeah, warehouses extended from the train mandates, said he was in BC. Well, this is a different question. He missed a day spread across multiple employers. I think that's on the other fellow's question. So I'm going to leave it there. I, I, we got through everyone today. I'm, I'm, you know, these are good questions. Um, again, the mix of vaccine questions is starting to go down and other questions are starting to go up and that's sort of reflective of, of, you know, changing dynamics in, in employment in Canada. Um, okay. Listen, thanks for joining us. These are wonderful questions. I really appreciated them all. Join us, uh, again on Monday, April 4th with the, uh, awesomely named Chris justice. He will be bringing justice to you, uh, for half an hour. 
uh, talking about all things employment law. Uh, again, if you need to get a hold of me or us, you can do so at employmentlawyer.ca. That's my name right there. That's how you spell it. Uh, help at employmentlawyer.ca. And you can call us at 1 855 821 5900. Uh, great questions, everyone. Uh, I'm glad we were able to get through them all. Have a wonderful and safe weekend, and I'll see you all right here. Same